includes questions on those regional development. We now move to questions to the Minister of Social Development, and of course we start with all questions. And I call Mike Nesbitt. Mr Nesbitt. Speaker, thank you very much. Question one. Mr Speaker, the figure I quoted in my statement to the Assembly in June of this year was the figure provided to me by the Chairman of the Housing Executive. The latest investigation by Campbell to Kell, which was released on the 21st of November, reports that there are overpayments estimated to be in the region of £9 million to £13 million. This is still a substantial amount of overpayment. And as far as I'm concerned, as I've said before, it would not matter whether it was £5 million, £10 million, £15 million or £20 million. It is too much. Let us not forget this is taxpayers' money that could have been used to build much-needed social homes. Therefore, in answer uh, to the question, uh, no, I have not apologised, nor do I have any plans to apologise. Number five has been withdrawn. Mr Nesbitt. Mr Speaker, uh, I acknowledge the, the Minister's answer. It was a, a question about whether he, was, whether he had apologised or planned to apologise to the four contractors whom he said uh, had overcharged by an estimated £18 million. Uh, if the Minister is not going to apologise, could he give a, an assessment of the damage, both in finances and reputational, to those four companies from quoting a figure on the 10th of June, which he now realises was wrong. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if the, the member was actually listening to what I said. And uh, therefore, perhaps ne uh, necessary to repeat for his information the fact that the figure that was quoted initially was that provided by the chair of the housing executive. The second figure was the figure quoted and produced in the report by Campbell to Kell. There is a piece of work that is still ongoing, <coughs> whereby the contractors and the housing executive together need to come to a final figure as to the level of repayments that will be required. And uh, the question was, uh, and again, I, I find this difficult to deal with because the members didn't seem to be able to listen. Uh, there was nothing to apologise for, and therefore there would not be an apology. There is a piece of work ongoing because there are a lot of lessons to be learned from the Campbell to Kell report. There's also work to be done in terms of coming to a final conclusion and an agreement as to what amount of money will have to be repaid. So it's clear that I'm saying that there will have to be repayments. Peter O'Weir. Mr O'Weir. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. And Minister, in light of the fact that failures have been identified, uh, which seems beyond doubt that whatever the disagreement over the amount of the figures, that there are clearly figures and mistakes made. Uh, can the Minister confirm now what action will be taken by the Board of the Northern Ireland Housing Executive? Well, I thank the member for the question, which gets very much to the heart of, of a core issue here. Uh, the Campbell to Kell report um, was commissioned by the Housing Executive. The Board of the Northern Ireland Housing Executive accepts the findings of the Campbell to Kell report and regrets the failure to resolve the issues raised at the time when these were first discovered. The Housing Executive Board has also agreed that this failing to recover overpayments over the period 2009 to 2012 was unacceptable and that it needed to be confident that adequate controls are now in place to prevent overpayments in future contracts. It's clear there are significant issues to be addressed in relation to the Housing Executive's management of contracts, and I welcome the Chairman's decisive action to establish a dedicated team to deal with these issues. Also, his proposals moving forward to create a new department focusing solely on maintenance contracts management, and I've assured the Chairman that he and the Board have my full support to deal with this regrettable issue and this regrettable situation and to take forward the wide-ranging programme of change and transformation that is required. I already meet regularly with the Chairman and will continue to keep this item on the agenda. And I welcome the fact that the Housing Executive Board is behaving 
in such a responsible way, unlike the attitude of some others who seem to have a cavalier attitude to millions and millions of pounds being overpaid. Eastwood. Mr. Eastwood. Thanks, uh, Mr. Speaker. I doubt very much that anyone has a cavalier attitude to millions of pounds being overspent. But given the fact that uh, but the t difference in figures is between five and nine million that we've heard today, how can this House have any confidence uh, that the Minister's figures are correct today? Um, the key point again is, I think, the member's use of the term the Minister's figures. I repeat again. The figure that I reported to the House initially was that provided by the Chairman of the House Executive. The second estimate was that produced uh, by the uh, company Campbell to Kell. The final figure of overpayments to be repaid will only be finalised when the process has been concluded between the House Executive and the companies that were the contractors involved in this regrettable situation. Jim Allister. Mr. Allister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, not only is the 18 million fig uh, figure now discredited, but we now know from the Campbell Tickell report that it came with a very severe caveat, because that report confirms that it was given as a broad brush estimate in need of refinement as more evidence is generated. Why did the minister give no mention to that in his rush in this house? to headline the £18 million figure? And did he, does he not think that he did have a duty of care to the four contractors, before naming them, to at least enter the caveat which was presented with the figure? Again, it's important to uh, recall exactly what was said, and the word estimate was the word that was used at the time, because it was an estimate that was provided to me by the Chair of the Housing Executive on the basis of figures that had been uh, given to him. Um, I made it clear at the time this was only an estimate, but the fact is, and I've said this already this afternoon, it doesn't matter whether it's 5, 10, 15, 18, whatever it is, when there are millions of pounds that have been overpaid by the Housing Executive to contractors, any responsible person will first of all recognise that it's a serious issue, and any sensible person will appreciate that the Minister in the relevant department has a responsibility to make it known to the members of this assembly. There would have been cries from all quarters if there hadn't been a report of such a serious situation. And I did the responsible thing and the right thing by making that information available to this House. Question number two, please. The 2011 House Condition Survey shows that fuel poverty affects 42 per cent of households. That is about 295,000 households in Northern Ireland. The survey recorded that there were 135,170 households in fuel poverty, where the householder was aged 60 or over. And that represents 46 per cent of all fuel poor households. 83,190, that's 52 per cent, of the householders aged between 60 and 74 are in fuel poverty, and 51,980 uh, people, that's 60 per cent of householders aged 75 and over, are in fuel poverty. So it's quite clear that as folk get older, there is uh, a higher level of fuel poverty, and uh, it's an issue indeed that I welcome the fact that the, the member has raised. Pam Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, given the Minister's answer, what, can he tell us what measures are in place uh, to provide assistance to older, vulnerable um, people in South Antrim? Our flagship scheme for many years has been the Warm Home Scheme, and that scheme has helped over 117,000 households in Northern Ireland to improve the energy efficiency of their homes. We also have the Boiler Replacement Scheme, which provides a grant of up to £1,000 to help householders replace older, less efficient boilers. Uh, and those schemes operate right across Northern Ireland, and that includes the South Antrim area. Mickey Brady. Mr. Brady. Uh, can call you. I thank the Minister for his answer. In relation to uh, people over 60 um, and fuel poverty, 
the Minister is aware that there is a, a large sum of uh, pension credit that is unclaimed by people 16 over every week. Could the Minister give us some idea of what he's doing to address that particular issue? Um, Mr Speaker, the uh, memory is the issue there of income and fuel poverty is impacted mainly by three factors, one of which is income. Um, brings us on to the area of benefit uptake and we have made that a priority within the department over the last two years um, with the result that we've, I think, got to a much better situation than previously. In fact, in one year we trebled the amount of income that had been brought into Northern Ireland through um, benefit uptake over a previous year. Um, which was a considerable achievement. And that has been done through more targeted um, interventions in raising awareness of benefits uh, that people should be claiming. Because there was clear evidence that amongst older people, uh, there wasn't necessarily the level of awareness that there should be. And they were one of the sectors that we felt needed uh, a particular intervention. So work has been done uh, in relation to uh, working with uh, organisations that deal with older folk. Um, but there are a whole series of targeted interventions, looking at particular areas, folk dealing, living with cancer, um, elderly folk, young families. And, and I think that that sort of more targeted intervention is the best way forward. There will be the general awareness raising, but also that targeted approach. Annie Kenahan, Mr Kenahan. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer and um, congratulate the staff in Antrim and Newton Abbey Council for the work they do in this field. But does the Minister accept that the rates of fuel poverty, as they were previously measured, have fallen only 2% in recent years, down from 44 to 42%? And does he not believe this is indicative of his department's failure to effectively address the issue? Well, I think the point is more indicative of the member's failure to understand the nature of fuel poverty, which is not the responsibility of one particular department, but of a number of departments. For example, um, in large parts of Northern Ireland, people do not have access to gas. And that's the west of the province. And that is an area of work that my colleague in uh, Dete, uh, Arlene Foster is taking forward to ensure that the gas pipelines move to the west of the province because one of the key factors in relation to the higher level of fuel poverty in Northern Ireland is that we are so heavily reliant on uh, oil, whereas in GB there is a much greater reliance on gas and therefore that impacts on the west of the province. Um, that I think is one of the, the, the biggest problems we face. Um, we have also worked extensively to deal with the issue of energy um, efficiency of homes or energy inefficiency being the problem. And for example, last week I had the opportunity of um, visiting some building sites in, uh, in Germany, in Stuttgart, to see their, the work that they were doing to make their houses much more energy efficient. So it's about raising income and our benefit uptake programs are quite effective in that regard. The cost of fuel, again, that is not within the remit of my own department, but spreading the, the gas network will help and also the energy efficiency of homes, the more we can do in that regard. And that's why uh, our, our work currently underway in uh, South Antrim, in Spring Farm, where there is a pilot uh, being done about the best way to retrofit homes, all of that will contribute to reducing the level of fuel poverty. Sean Rogers. Mr. Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for his answers thus far. Could the Minister advise this House, has he any plans to help those with long-term sickness or cancer with their uh, fuel poverty concerns? Well, I've already mentioned there that in regard to um, our, our benefit uptake campaign, uh, and I've mentioned there also that income is one of the, the issues in terms of uh, reducing energy uh, or ener fuel poverty. Uh, in terms of people who are suffering from cancer, um, we have made that a focus for the, the targeted um, benefit uptake campaign, and that has been, I think, reasonably uh, successful. It was one of the more successful interventions. So we can do something there, but in terms of a specific intervention um, for people suffering from cancer, um, our other programmes are all entirely open to people who have that unfortunate uh, condition. Um, the, the boiler replacement, the warm home scheme, all of these things are generally available. That is the one thing that is particularly uh, relevant, I think most helpful to people with, with that particular problem. For Hi, McCann. Mr McCann. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Chairman of the Housing Executive, in his press release dated the 10th of June 
2013, stated that the board of the housing executive had commissioned an independent review into how the organisation has been dealing with planned maintenance contracts over the last five years, following evidence of substantial overcharging. The initial processes of appointing the consultant at that time were managed by the chairman. The member may wish to note my answer to Assembly Question 24342, 11 to 15, when I previously explained the procurement process followed in the appointment of Campbell to Kell. However, for the benefit of the member today, I can advise again that the procurement process followed was in line with the appropriate procurement guidance for the direct award of contracts, also known as single tender action, and the use of consultants. I want to thank the, the, the Minister uh, for his, his answer up tonight, but it's my understanding uh, that the, 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 the process uh, that the, 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 the chair of the Housing Executive uh, followed uh, was done over a short period of time, and, time in a matter of days, and didn't follow uh, the tender and procedures that were set down uh, to appoint contracts. Um, the first point there, as, as regards the nature of the process, uh, I was not party to that process. However, um, I've stated already that I am uh, reliably assured uh, that the appropriate procurement guidance was followed, that there is a guidance for the direct award of contracts, single tender action, and the use of consultants, and that that was followed. Uh, the timescale for it, I think it was, uh, it's important to bear in mind here that this was something that needed to be done quickly. We are talking about very substantial amounts of money. We're talking about very substantial amounts of money. And it was important that the housing executive move quickly to show their concern about this situation, that they get information to clarify how this situation had arisen. And in answer to an early question, I, I spoke about the course of action now being taken by the housing executive in the light of that report. And I think it's that outworking of the report that proves indeed that the chairman and the housing executive took the right approach by moving quickly uh, forward on this as a matter of urgency. On that, Mr. Dowd. Speaker, I've listened very carefully to the Minister's response, but surely the Minister must understand that the Tickle report at this stage is so discredited that really the only honourable thing for the Minister to do would be put his hands up and say, look, it's rubbish. <laughs> well, the company concerned, um, Campbell to Kell, um, is a company that has previous experience in this field. It is reported on a wide range of matters, including frauds, mismanagement, financial malpractice, complex financial issues, governance and management issues, and previously conducted a statutory inquiry for the then Housing Corporation, looking into mismanagement in a specialist housing uh, association. So, uh, this is a field in which they have some experience, and I would suspect they are probably more experienced in that field than Mr. Dallet. Creed. Mr. Creed. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, I thank the Minister for his response. Um, in my opinion, the Campbell to Kell simply didn't come close, for example, to the forensic investigation carried out by ASM Howard into Red Sky. But the Minister may be aware that, um, in addition to that report, there was one produced in conjunction with the contractors, uh, which led to four sets of individual accounts uh, by two independent cost consultants one appointed by the executive, the other by the contractors. Um, will the minister try to bridge the apparent uh, contradiction, quite massive contradiction, between this report and the one produced by Campbell for Kit Thank you. Um, let me assure the member there are not two reports, there is only one report. <clears throat> Whatever may have appeared in a press statement from somebody or other, there is no second report. There is a process of work being taken forward in relation to these contractors and the housing executive. But the only report, the one that was commissioned by the housing executive board, the one that has been endorsed and accepted by the housing executive board, and the one that was presented then to the Social Development Committee, is the Campbell to Kell report. And I think it is a report that people are very foolish to dismiss out of hand in the way that some people want to. 
Again, I used the word earlier, cavalier. There seems to be almost a cavalier approach to some of this. The issues that have been identified in the Campbell to Kerr report are very serious, substantial and substantive issues that need to be addressed because they get to the bottom of why this situation arose. They get to the bottom of how it was that there were such serious shortcomings within the housing executive and why, in that context, it was possible for such substantial overpayments to be made. William Irwin. Mr. Irwin. Question number four, Mr. Speaker. A range of improvement schemes are programmed within the Housing Executive's Armagh District Office area for 2014-2015. These include kitchen replacements to 48 dwellings at Woodford, Caramoyle, external cyclical maintenance to 291 properties at Armagh Town, Charlemont, double glazing to 144 dwellings at Tandrick E, Armagh Town, Points Pass, and heating replacements to 73 dwellings at various locations in Armagh Town and rural areas. A total of 18 housing executive properties are also included in the proposed stock transfer programme within the Armagh district, with six at Hillside Avenue, Hamilton's Bawn, 12 in Drumhillery Park, Middletown. That transfer process will begin in mid-2014. In addition, and finally, a number of new build schemes are programmed to be delivered within Armagh City and District Council area during the period 1314 to 1516. These include 28 units of supported housing and 36 units of general needs housing. The Housing Executive is currently in the process of formulating a new social housing development programme for the three-year period 1415 to 1617. And subject to my approval, this will be published on the Housing Executive's website in January 2014. Can I thank the Minister for his comprehensive response uh, to my question? Uh, can I ask the Minister uh, if he's aware that there are any property checks on winter property checks on older properties that do not have proper insulation? Is he aware of them? Um, the Housing Executive is carrying out an ongoing programme of, in relation to the energy efficiency of, of all of its properties at stock. Um, and that was something that I referred to earlier. It's part of a wider piece of work. Um, first of all, to identify the value of their stock, because to get the value of their stock established, you need to know the condition of the stock, which that's one of the issues. And then secondly, they also want to identify where there are particular problems of energy efficiency or energy inefficiency, um, which might be addressed um, through the work that's being taken forward in Spring Farm. There are quite a number of rural properties that would have um, old stone walls, uh, low level of, of uh, thermal insulation, and what is the best way to address that? So the work in that in Spring Farm will hopefully help to uh, determine the best way of addressing that uh, for the benefit of the tenants. Order, ju ju just before I call Mr. Beggs, and I'm sure the member is quite conscious, this is a specific question, to a specific constituency, which is Armagh District. And I would have no doubt the member has no intentions of widening a question out. No intentions. So I think that is important I say that. But let's not prejudge the member. Mr. Beggs. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Minister has indicated that some 36 new general housings would, would be built in, in the Armagh area. Can the Minister advise how has he personally ensured that this plan uh, adequately reflects the changes that may result and be the requirements subsequent to any changes to the Welfare Reform Bill. Um, one of the issues that I've raised in the past couple of years with the Housing Executive when they bring forward their social housing development programme is indeed the potential impact of welfare reform um, and the need therefore for a, a number of smaller sized properties uh, suitable for one or two people. Um, the first time that I raised it, I did so because when I challenged the Housing Executive about it, the officials actually admitted that they hadn't taken any account of welfare reform in designing the programme. They were sent back to redo the job and they came back with a revised programme. Uh, it is now something that features in their programme that there are more smaller properties to address the need uh, potentially in the longer term for um, the, the difficulties that might arise with uh, what is commonly referred to as a bedroom tax. Mr. Mutri. Mr. Mutri. Six, Mr. Speaker. The grant of £461,000 
which was awarded to Lurgan Town Arena Football Club, will allow the club to provide a new and larger clubhouse, a half-size 3G pitch, which will be available for use by local schools, replacement floodlights and associated site works. This will not only help the club to increase the number of young people uh, participating in sport, but will also allow it to engage further within the local community by running education, health and social awareness programmes. And I had the opportunity of uh, visiting uh, the ground in Lurgan uh, some time ago. It's a club with 380 members, um, many of whom come from neighbourhood renewal areas, has 40 volunteers, and that ties in very much with our department's commitment to support volunteering. And I'm pleased to say their 3G pitch is already oversubscribed. Uh, so it's an excellent example of a local football club playing a role in the wider community context. And I would encourage neighbourhood renewal areas to consider always the inclusion of sport, sporting facilities, sporting programmes within their overall programmes. Sometimes neighbourhood renewal partnerships may overlook sport, but it has an important role in relation to health and also uh, to uh, addressing the needs of young people. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that very positive news. Can I uh, perhaps push him further and ask him to indicate when the Mournview Grey Estates multi-use games area will be completed, also in Lurgan? Um, I'm pleased to assure the member that the Mournview multi-use games area, or MUGA, is being constructed by Craig Avon Borough Council with funding of £145,000 from the Neighbourhood Renewal Investment Fund. I'm aware of the many delays the scheme has experienced, firstly in terms of finding a suitable site, and more recently in regards to finalising the legal arrangements with the Southern Education and Library Board and completing the tendering exercise. I understand that the contractor is due to go on site after Christmas, and it is hoped that, weather permitting, the project will be completed by the end of March, which will be good news for those in the Mournview area. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question seven. As at the 1st of December 2013, a total of 3,884 applicants were registered on the waiting list for the North Belfast constituency area. Of those, 2,255 were deemed to be in housing stress with 30 points or more. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for uh, his answer. The Minister would be aware that there is currently a narrative among some, mem or among some uh, members of the, of the media and also amongst politicians that the housing need in the constituency of North Belfast is overwhelmingly nationalist. Can the Minister confirm if this is indeed true? Thank the member for her question and take the opportunity indeed to explain that that narrative is a totally false, unfounded and erroneous narrative. When people register for housing, they can self-identify as being Protestant or Roman Catholic or indeed a range of other options, uh, non-refused, unknown, mixed, other religious groups. But if we uh, take the figures for those who self-identify as being either Protestant or Roman Catholic, the figures in North Belfast are in many ways uh, quite similar. Um, for example, if you count those on the waiting list at the moment as of the 1st of December from the Protestant community, it is 1,479. If you take the figure for the Roman Catholic community, it is 1,489. So there is really a difference there of less than, um, less than 1%. The housing waiting list there for Protestants and Roman Catholics in North Belfast are therefore roughly equal. You find over a period of time you'll have slight fluctuations. It may go 1% one way or the other over a period of months as people come on and off the waiting list. But it does refute very much this damaging and I won't say corrosive narrative which suggests that there is an overwhelming demand in one community and virtually no demand in the other community. The housing waiting list in the two communities is virtually the same. 
Sometimes people argue that you should deal with the issue of people who refuse to identify or um, whose identity, religious identity is unknown. But that's actually taking away from people the right not to self-identify. Even, however, when you look at that, and if you attempt to allocate people to a particular group on the basis of where they've chosen uh, to live, for example, someone's from Ardoin, I was put down Ardoin as their choice of area, um, they're probably not from the Protestant Unionist community. Uh, likewise, as Johnny puts down for Mid Shankle, they're probably time, not the Catholic National Time's community. almost gone. But even when you do that, uh, it makes virtually no difference. The needs in the two communities are almost exactly equal. Order members, that concludes all questions in the social development. We now move to topical questions uh, to the Minister. Trevor Lunn. Mr Lunn. Yes, thank you. Mr Speaker, uh, the, the Minister was severely critical last week of the sentence handed down by the courts to Thomas Beresford, the Loyalist bandsman. Can I ask him how he reconciles that criticism with... Order, order, order. I, I, I did already warn the House that topical questions should be questions that very much is the responsibility of the Minister within his department. Now, I'm prepared to let the member finish uh, because sometimes uh, supplementary questions and questions, they grow legs. So I'll allow the member to finish. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the rest of the question was, how does he, the Minister reconcile his criticism of that sentence with his obligation under the Pledge of Office to support the police and the court yeah, and to uphold the rule of law? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure that there will be some reflection afterwards as to whether questions of this format are, are uh, appropriate or not and I'm sure that the Speaker in due course will want to consider that. However, I'll just make two points to the member. First of all, I spoke on that occasion very clearly as a local representative and representing the interests of uh, people from uh, the community. And secondly, I did say in the course of the statement, if the member had actually read it all, that there should be respect for law. That was clearly stated. My comment was purely on the extent of the uh, punishment that was handed out to the individual in the context of this being the very first instance where someone had been uh, brought before the courts and then uh, sent to prison uh, for a period of months for playing uh, a piece of music. Trevor Long, Mr Long. Yeah, well, I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, he, he was critical of the, the court's decision and he can hardly divorce himself from being a minister when it suits him in these situations. Now, my supplementary has given his intention to crack down on benefit fraud. How does he expect to be taken seriously when he can be so selective in his support for court decisions and his adherence to the Pledge of Office? The Department of Social Development deals with a lot of very complex and difficult issues. Issues that matter a lot to people. Issues about housing, welfare, community regeneration, addressing dereliction, addressing town centre regeneration. And I'm disappointed that the member was unable to find anything within that totally broad remit about which to ask a question. I would take his question more seriously if I had seen a pattern from him of challenging some other ministers from the other side of the chamber about some of the things that they've done, because I've never heard him do it yet. Stephen Mitry. Mr. Mitry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, can he outline the investment to date since he came into office for public realm works by his own department and towns and city centres across Northern Ireland? I thank the member for the question, which is one of the very central areas of work that my department undertakes and one which is highly valued by local communities, by councils, by traders and by residents because improving the public realm in a town or city is a fundamental part of any regeneration program. And during my time in office, I've approved funding of 66 million pounds for 177 public realm schemes across Northern Ireland. For example, some schemes have been completed in Belfast city centre phase one, 28 million pounds, Portrush station square, 1.3 million pounds, Lurgan town centre, 1.8 million pounds, and Queen's Quay in Londonderry, 688,000 pounds. And those schemes have involved making improvements to the pavements, to the roadways, the street lighting, the furniture, and public art. All of the schemes have been widely welcomed 
by the local community, by local residents, by visitors to the towns and cities, and the local traders, because they've had a positive social and economic impact uh, in those particular areas. Uh, I thank the Minister for his response, and would he agree with me that the financial investment that he makes in our town and city centres, not least of all the difference that has made in my own town centre in Lurgan, is beneficial to the communities and it makes them a more attractive place for people to come and shop? Um, the members focused the issue very much in relation to traders there, and it is true that over the past five years, Local traders right across the province and indeed right across the United Kingdom and further afield have faced difficult trading conditions. However, the investment that the department has made to transform town and city centres has helped to support businesses and indeed improve the vibrancy and the footfall in towns and cities. Uh, when you create attractive, open and shared places, that's one of the best ways to encourage families to return to them and spend more time in our high streets. There are other things that are drawing people away from town centres, whether it be internet shopping or out of town centres. This is work that helps to draw people back in and to sustain the town centres. Portadown and Lurgan have seen on average a 34% increase in footfall. Belfast has experienced a 55% increase and Newcastle experienced a phenomenal increase of nearly 300%. That increase in footfall has also led to an improvement in business confidence. For example, the Belfast Streets Ahead scheme resulted in private sector investment on 20 refurbishments of premises and 64 new businesses opening in the area. Work to progress new schemes in partnership with Council in towns such as Ballymena, Belfast Bank Square, Bangor and Newton Ards are well advanced, as everyone has seen that investing in our public realm really does help to make our towns much more family friendly and thereby supports uh, the town centre and the traders therein. Thank you. Lynch. Mr Lynch. Colonel Mayor, I'll get uh, Callan call you. I'll, I know the Minister mentioned during question time that he had been struck yard last week to look at Orders, homes. Can, can I apologise to the member? I have sort of jumped to his question uh, far too soon. <laughs> David Hillage. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, having reached the last question time of the year, can I ask the Minister if he believes that the Welfare Reform Bill uh, will have made any progress before the end of the year, uh, considering the government deadline of the new year, when they have said that the, the uh, devolved situation here will have to face bills of £5 million per month? Um, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for that question because it is appropriate that at this uh, final question time of 2013 we have this item on the agenda. The member will be well aware, indeed other members are, that I have been working extensively with executive colleagues to progress the welfare reform bill through the Assembly and indeed to achieve the best possible outcome for the citizens of Northern Ireland. Um, at the last uh, meeting of uh, the executive it was agreed to reconvene the Executive Subcommittee on Welfare Reform, uh, and a meeting of that subcommittee has now been scheduled for next Monday, uh, the 16th of December. Um, it really is a one-item agenda. Um, I don't know what else there will be on the agenda other than one item, and that is how do we move this forward. Um, I would certainly have hoped that we would have made swifter progress. Um, I hope that we can make progress after that meeting next Monday. But given the Christmas recess, the earliest that any bill can be brought back to the executive for decision would be the 16th of January. And if we meet that deadline, uh, then I could expect the bill to receive royal assent by the end of March or early April. But since, as you've rightly pointed out, um, the um, message clearly from Westminster, from uh, the Department for Work and Pensions, the Secretary of State and the Treasurer has been that if we miss the January deadline, then the penalties of approximately £5 million pounds per month will kick in. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and welcome the, the answer from the Minister. And perhaps he would give us another message. And dare I ask how he feels, uh, is this a good use of the limited block grant that we receive? The one word answer to that would be no. It's not a good use of our limited block grant. Um, the Chief Secretary to the Treasury has written to the Finance Minister 
highlighting his concerns about the delay in the welfare reform bill uh, for Northern Ireland and indicating that the UK government can make adjustments to the Northern Ireland block grant for the additional cost of the Exchequer for Amy spending controls which are not achieved. Treasury have estimated the cost to be around £5 million per month since April 2013, £50 to £60 million by January 2014 and well over £200 million a year by 1718. The Chief Secretary has stated clearly, categorically, that it will be necessary to make Dell, uh, begin to make Dell adjustments unless the reforms are implemented by January 2014. And the fact of the matter is this. When you start taking five and then 60 and up to 200 million pounds a year off the block grant, that cuts into the money that other departments have to spend, because it's not going to be coming off my budget. Every department will be affected here. And that means an impact on classrooms, on teachers, on schools, on hospitals, on nurses, on social services, on operations, whatever it is, right across the realm of health and education, there is a significant impact. And people should get that very clearly in their minds. This is not something that's uh, just out there floating about in the ether. This is a reality. And it's important that people grasp that and therefore that the nettle is grasped and that we deal with this issue as a matter of urgency. We've got a very good package of measures that I've been able to negotiate with Westminster and also with the discussions with OFM, DFM. We need to get those out there for open discussion. That's what the community widely wants. It's been acknowledged by the uh, Voluntary and Community Centre. Nick made that very clear. Others have said it to us. We Minister's need to be in a position to move forward on this. Now Sean Lynch. Where am I? I'll get... Uh, uh, Last, or can call you. As I said earlier, the Minister mentioned in question time that he had been struck guard, I think, last week, looking at homes with poor or no insulation. And he particularly mentioned houses with uh, concrete skin or no cavity walls. Could I ask the Minister what he has learned uh, from his visit and uh, could it be useful for our own circumstances here? Um, I find it very informative indeed. Um, to, to see the, the difference that it made in the energy efficiency of the properties that we visited. They were retrofitting properties that quite a lot of them had been built in the 60s, they were 60s, early 70s, they were around 40 years old. Um, they were being very substantially retrofitted with a very high level of insulation. Um, there are other things that follow on. If you insulate, there are other things you must do to make sure that the house functions properly. But uh, there are good practical examples there of what can be done. I've mentioned already this afternoon the pilot work going ahead there at Spring Farm in Antrim, which will benefit not only Northern Ireland but the whole of the United Kingdom. This is an issue that should have been addressed some years ago because this sort of work has been ongoing in uh, GB for some time, certainly been underway on the continent for quite a long time, and they're dealing with much more colder conditions than we would have here in Northern Ireland. Um, the extent of the insulation, I thought, was very significant. Um, the, the way in which they build properties, again, there were lessons to be learned there. And I'm pleased that we had with us people from the Construction Industry Training Board, people from the Master Builders Association, and from the Housing Executive, because there are connections being developed there between experts in Northern Ireland and experts in Germany. We can learn from each other, and I think uh, they can gain some ways from us. We can gain from them. We certainly uh, want to see this done. As I say, it should have been done a long time ago because it is not right that people should be uh, left languishing in properties that are cold uh, and damp. Sean Lynch. I'll get the can call you. I'm going with the session area and Alison Fragerson. And I want to thank them, the Minister, for his uh, fairly elaborate uh, and comprehensive answer. But uh, I would ask the Minister, he is aware that there are houses and homes in this part of the country which have poor insulation, and I would ask the Minister what measures he's going to put in place, uh, particularly there are some even relatively new homes, social houses, and houses like Mount Erigels, which is in Poldlas, which have seen their homes deteriorate as a result recently. I suppose there are three elements to this. The first is the technology, and that's what I've spoken about so far. Um, and I think there's a clear idea on, on the way that that should be taken forward. There was some work done retrofitting houses previously, for example, by putting an inner skin on some walls, which didn't work. Uh, the, the 
effect of it lasted for maybe a year or two, but it wasn't a long-lasting effect. So we need to get the right technology. Secondly, there's the issue of social housing and then the issue of private owners. Um, the issue of social housing, um, we've made that a, a target for the housing executive, and that's why they're involved in all of these schemes. Um, that's why um, they are, are measuring the energy efficiency of their properties at the moment, uh, something I referred to earlier, uh, so that they know the type of properties. Some of them are no finds, some of them are solid old stone walls. There are even some orlet properties and um, old corrugated bungalows. So the, we need to get the issue of social housing dealt with. There's also then that uh, more complex issue around the private owner and uh, what can be done to support them. And that is something that will have to be taken through uh, not just the technology, but how that might be supported in some way and what sort of business case might be constructed around that. Order members, time is up. Um.